Welcome to Making the Case. I'm Laverne McGee. Yodit will be along shortly. First up on the docket, the Derek Chauvin trial. Court's been adjourned until Monday, and that's when both the state and defense will give their closing arguments. Then all eyes will be on the 12 men and women who will be deliberating whether Derek Chauvin is guilty of second-degree murder, third-degree murder, second-degree manslaughter, or nothing at all. Tonight, we'll talk about everything this jury has to process and consider. We'll also discuss some of the other legal headlines involving deadly encounters with police unfolding across the country. In San Francisco, we've got Paul Henderson, veteran prosecutor and BNC's legal contributor. In Atlanta, C.K. Hoffler, a longtime trial lawyer and president of the National Bar Association. And we begin in Minneapolis, where Dre Clark has been covering the Derek Chauvin trial. Dre, what's the move been like there in Hennepin County now that we're getting closer to a possible verdict? Laverne, good evening. Certainly the mood has shifted here in Minneapolis, and so has the show of force. Uh, pretty much on almost every corner here in downtown, you will see members of the National Guard and state troopers also making the rounds constantly as well. Clearly, they are anticipating and getting ready for a verdict that could come as early as sometime uh, next week. Also throughout downtown, many of the businesses now are covered with plywood uh, in anticipation also of any type of protest or civil unrest that may occur once that verdict comes in. Of course, the jury uh, is on recess this weekend until Monday. That is when uh, both sides will give their closing arguments to the jury, and then the jury will be given their instructions by Judge Peter Cahill, and they can begin deliberations. The jury, by the way, will also be sequestered. At issue here is Derek Chauvin, charged with murder and manslaughter for the killing of George Floyd last May 25th. The prosecution maintains that George Floyd died because Derek Chauvin had his knee pressed into George Floyd's neck for, no, for more than nine minutes. On the defense side, they maintain that George Floyd lost his life because he ingested drugs just as he was being arrested and he has a pre-existing heart condition. The bottom line is it will come down to 12 members of the jury. Five men, seven women, four of those jurors are black. They will have the final say so. Meanwhile, out here on the streets, it's obviously very tense. We also had the situation that happened in nearby Brooklyn Center with the shooting and killing of Dante Wright. So everyone is very emotional. And yes, there are some who are even concerned that Derek Chauvin could be very well be acquitted. All it takes is for one juror to express doubt here and uh, there would be no conviction. So now the worrying and the waiting is setting in. But meanwhile, here on the streets of Minneapolis and throughout Hennepin County, uh, law enforcement sending a clear message. You can protest peacefully, but if you should decide to do anything in the way of chaos or destruction, you will be met with the full force of the law. Black Lives Matter, it's proven to be more than a hashtag, but a movement and a global rallying cry against the injustice the black community faces. My BNC colleague, Mark Lamont Hill, spoke exclusively with Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors. She talked about the controversy and criticism surrounding her personal spending, the organization's finances, and more. Take a listen. Um, I think there are, as you said, there are um, some grounded critiques of me and BLM, and I take those grounded critiques very seriously. And then there's some critiques, even if it's not from the right, grounded in more white supremacy and misogynoir. And that's just where we live right now. It's hard building movements. It's hard building Black-led institutions. Um, we are doing something that many people haven't done, Black women at the forefront. Um, that is hard to comprehend. That's hard to understand. Uh, but I promise you that what I have done, with other, what other BLM leaders have done in the organization, um, and what we're trying to do is get Black people free. That's what we're trying to do. And we're going to make mistakes. We're going to stumble. Um, but I need the community. We need the community to lift us up so that we can be accountable in a principled way, in an honest way, and most importantly, in a loving way. Tonight, I'm honored to have my colleague, Mark Lamont Hill, joining me to discuss his exclusive interview. Mark, welcome. Hey, we got to have the backstory on how this interview came together. Well, you know, I've known uh, Patrice Cullors for a long time. I actually met her uh, right uh, around the time of the Ferguson uprisings in 2014. And we had a professional relationship. We became friends and, and, and we've spoken from time to time. And honestly, when everything uh, happened over the last few weeks in terms of the media uh, outrage. I was concerned 
uh, about her. I, I wanted to make sure that she had a space for her voice to be heard. I wanted to make sure that she had an opportunity to tell her truth, but also to be challenged, which is my job as a, as a journalist. Uh, and so we reached out and asked her to come and she uh, said yes. And I'm very grateful that she gave an exclusive interview to Black News Channel. BNC got this, not one of the other uh, outlets. I think that's an important sign of her commitment to black institutions and black movements. Uh, and we had the conversation. There were no restrictions. I, I didn't send the questions ahead of time, but I was very honest and direct and said, hey, I'm going to ask some tough questions and, and uh, you know, you're going to have to answer. Yeah, she was actually pretty candid, I thought. But did you get the answers you were expecting? Uh, sometimes, you know, I, I had no doubt uh, that the money that people are talking about that came into Black Lives Matter gra grassroots movement uh, was on the up and up. I had no doubt that she wasn't taking anything and I knew that she wasn't taking a salary. I had done my homework. I had done my due diligence. I knew all of that. Uh, and, and so I knew she would be able to refute those lies. Uh, the question about owning homes and who's in those homes and why she has those homes and how those homes uh, correspond with her politics, that was something that I didn't quite know how she'd answer. And she answered them, I think, in a fairly transparent way, uh, in a way that she found principled. Uh, it left some people wanting more. It left some people satisfied. Uh, but I was, um, I was happy that she gave the answers as thoroughly and as candidly as she could. And when I pushed back, uh, she gave me more. And I think that's our job. And I think that's her job. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. And I mean, I watched the interview and then I've been, you know, following it all day. You know, it's on social media. People are weighing in. I got to tell you, some people are still saying that they're concerned because she answered the questions, of course, about the money and the organization, but they still didn't get a sense of whether or not she understood how serious it was and the magnitude of this movement and how it's so critical, you know, with, with a shadow of doubt cast over it how that affects so many people. Do you think she really gets that sense of just how powerful I, it is? I, and because people question it, it kind of questions, you know, all black folks and what they're trying to do? I do, I think she gets the enormity of it. I, I think that's why when she started the interview and she unequivocally denied the innuendos and the rumors, she said it's incredibly false, but she also said it's incredibly dangerous. I think she understands that when you impugn her and impugn uh, the work of her organization, which is often seen as the, the face of the movement itself, it casts a shadow of doubt over the movement and the legitimacy of the movement itself, which is not to aggrandize any single person. But as she said, it's to help us get free. So I think she understands how high the stakes are. Now, I think where uh, the rubber meets the road and where we have to have some tough conversations, of course, is whether she fully appreciates and owns those grounded critiques that she brought up. You know, some people will say, yeah, she, she says she understands the criticisms, but is she responding properly? Other people are saying, look, she gets it. She's doing her best against the odds. It's an uphill climb to build a black led organization for freedom uh, with all of the madness and all the noise. And so those two perspectives are battling each other. And I think in the interview last night, we saw how clearly she understands that battle. Uh, and people are gonna make their own decisions about whether or not they, they Black Lives Matter, it's proven to be more than a hashtag, but a movement and a global rallying cry against the injustice the black community faces. My BNC colleague Mark Lamont Hill spoke exclusively with Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors. She talked about the controversy and criticism surrounding her personal spending, the organization's finances and more. Take a listen. Um, I think there are, as you said, there are um, some grounded critiques of me and BLM, and I take those grounded critiques very seriously. And then there's some critiques, even if it's not from the right, grounded in more white supremacy and misogynoir. And that's just where we live right now. It's hard building movements. It's hard building Black-led institutions. Um, we are doing something that many people haven't done, Black women at the forefront. Um, that is hard to comprehend. That's hard to understand. Uh, but I promise you that what I have done, with o what other BLM leaders have done in the organization, um, and what we're trying to do is get Black people free. That's what we're trying to do. And we're going to make mistakes. We're going to stumble. Um, but I need the community. We need the community to lift us up so that we can be accountable in a principled way, in an honest way, and most importantly, in a loving way. Tonight, I'm honored to have my colleague, Mark Lamont Hill, joining me to discuss his exclusive interview. Mark, welcome. Hey, we got to have the backstory on how this interview came together. 
Well, you know, I've known uh, Patrice Cullors for a long time. I actually met her uh, right uh, around the time of the Ferguson uprisings in 2014. And we had a professional relationship. We became friends, and, and, and we've spoken from time to time. And honestly, when everything uh, happened over the last few weeks in terms of the media uh, outrage, I was concerned uh, about her. Uh, I wanted to make sure that she had a space for her voice to be heard. I wanted to make sure that she had an opportunity to tell her truth, but also to be challenged, which is my job as a, as a journalist. Uh, and so we reached out and asked her to come, and she uh, said yes. And I'm very grateful that she gave an exclusive interview to Black News Channel. BNC got this, not one of the other uh, outlets. I think that's an important sign of her commitment to black institutions and black movements. Uh, and we had the conversation. There were no restrictions. I, I didn't send the questions ahead of time. But I was very honest and direct and said, hey, I'm going to ask some tough questions, and, and uh, you know, you're going to have to answer yeah, she was actually pretty candid, I thought. But did you get the answers you were expecting? Uh, sometimes, you know, I, I had no doubt uh, that the money that people are talking about that came into Black Lives Matter gra grassroots movement uh, was on the up and up. I had no doubt that she wasn't taking anything. And I knew that she wasn't taking a salary. I had done my homework. I had done my due diligence. I knew all of that. Uh, and, and so I knew she would be able to refute those lies. Uh, the question about owning homes and who's in those homes and why she has those homes and how those homes uh, correspond with her politics, that was something that I didn't quite know how she'd answer. And she answered them, I think, in a fairly transparent way, uh, in a way that she found principled. Uh, it left some people wanting more. It left some people satisfied. Uh, but I was, um, I was happy that she gave the answers as thoroughly and as candidly as she could. And when I pushed back, uh, she gave me more. And I think that's our job. And I think that's her job. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. And I mean, I watched the interview and then I've been, you know, following it all day. You know, it's on social media. People are weighing in. I got to tell you, some people are still saying that they're concerned because she answered the questions, of course, about the money and the organization, but they still didn't get a sense of whether or not she understood how serious it was and the magnitude of this movement and how it's so critical, you know, with, with a shadow of doubt cast over it how that affects so many people. Do you think she really gets that sense of just how powerful I, it is? I, and because people question it, it kind of questions, you know, all black folks and what they're trying to do? I do. I think she gets the enormity of it. I, I think that's why when she started the interview and she unequivocally denied the innuendos and the rumors, she said it's incredibly false, but she also said it's incredibly dangerous. I think she understands that when you impugn her and impugn uh, the work of her organization, which is often seen as the, the face of the movement itself, it casts a shadow of doubt over the movement and the legitimacy of the movement itself, which is not to aggrandize any single person. But as she said, it's to help us get free. So I think she understands how high the stakes are. Now, I think where uh, the rubber meets the road and where we have to have some tough conversations, of course, is whether she fully appreciates and owns those grounded critiques that she brought up. You know, some people will say, yeah, she, she says she understands the criticisms, but is she responding properly? Other people are saying, look, she gets it. She's doing her best against the odds. It's an uphill climb to build a black led organization for freedom uh, with all of the madness and all the noise. And so those two perspectives are battling each other. And I think in the interview last night, we saw how clearly she understands that battle. Uh, and people are going to make their own decisions about whether or not they, they found her comments acceptable or not. Um, I think that it's important, though, uh, that we listen to the whole interview. And for folks who didn't get a chance to see the interview, it's available uh, on uh, YouTube and it's available on the BNC social media pages. Check out the interview. See, hear everything she said and make your own determination. Yeah, absolutely. You can go to BNC News, of course. That's our online handle. But have you actually spoken to Patrice, you know, since you did this interview with her yesterday? We haven't had an in-depth conversation. Uh, she thanked me for giving her the space. I thanked her for giving me her time and her candor. Uh, but we haven't had time to talk about I don't have a sense of her response or any uh, sense of how she felt about the interview other than the fact that I asked the questions I needed to ask and she answered them. Uh, I did see, though, that the uh, Black Lives Matter official Twitter handle did tweet the interview and, s and said that the interview was an opportunity uh, to see how she refutes these allegations. So they seem to be happy with the interview. They seem to feel like it positively represented her. So I'm excited to do that. And again, I'm very proud uh, that Black News Channel, that BNC, got this interview, not for me personally, but it's a, it's a reminder of how important black media is and what's possible when we trust each other and invest in each other.
It is so important, Mark. And one of the things that she also brought up was the fact that, you know, this is very new to have this black organization like this with such power. And she actually talked about when people were accusing her of taking money or using money, she pointed to the Catholic Church uh, and, you know, pointed to other huge organizations uh, that people don't necessarily equate with uh, fairness and opportunity. She kind of talked about the fact that those organizations, they, they, they need money and they're funded with money. What were your thoughts on that? I think she made an important connection, and in some ways she's absolutely right. There's a scrutiny that we give black folk that we don't give other people. You go to a black-owned restaurant and it's 15 minutes late with your food, people say, <clears throat> see, that's why I don't go to black businesses. Meanwhile, you'll stand in line at the Olive Garden Red Lobster for an hour waiting for your little remote control to vibrate. You know, there's a way that we have different expectations for each other. <laughs> And so if you're going to scrutinize uh, BLM, then you better be prepared to scrutinize all these other institutions. Uh, and I think she's right about that. And there's a particular way that the income and the livelihood and the prosperity of black women in particular in a world that hates black women uh, is um, particularly scrutinized. And so I think we have to be honest about that. But I think the other side of that argument is to say, well, yeah, we're holding you to a different standard because we believe in you more. We put our faith in you. We put the possibility of, of freedom and justice in the hands of this young movement. And so, yeah, we hold you to a higher standard than the police or the Catholic Church or, or Amazon because we don't love them. We love you. And so we want you to be better. And so that's the other side of that argument. And so I, I say, yeah, treat them fairly, hold them accountable and try to hold those two things in balance at all times. Yeah, she's held to, a, held to a very high standard. But thanks so much, Mark. We appreciate your time. And, of course, we always want to join in to your show. Black News Tonight, that's at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, weeknights right here on Black News Channel, right before making the case. So Mark just gave us his thoughts on his exclusive interview with Patrice Cullors. And now we want to hear from you. For those of you who watched last night's interview or on our YouTube channel, what are your thoughts? Some of your responses are coming up after the break.
Welcome back to Making the Case. I'm Laverne McGee. Yodit will be along shortly. Well, we asked you earlier today to weigh in on the exclusive interview Mark Lamont Hill had with Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors. There's been controversy about the organization's finances and her personal spending choices. Well, we asked those of you who watched the interview to weigh in. Adrian says, I think she deflected a lot of questions. While she may not take salary, she does receive more attention and money because she's a founder of that organization. And the organization seems to be aiming to gain power and prominence for members of the organization instead of empowering individual black people so they can lift their communities. Some people thought that, I guess it depends on how you all looked at it. But Melissa also says, my heart aches for this woman, my gosh. To devote your life to fighting for justice and being treated like this is absolutely appalling. You may have seen the part of the interview where she was actually in tears because she felt like she could be in danger because there was pictures of her house online. Renee also says, I don't know that she fully answered the questions, particularly when Mark asked her about how she, in essence, was profiting from the trauma and death of black lives. Yeah, definitely sensitive. Uh, Mark was definitely fair with her and she gave her perspective. You know, it's hard to get the full story in a short interview like that on the magnitude of such a huge organization that's known worldwide. Uh, but you know that we will bring you more if we get it here on the Black News Channel. Mark Lamont Hill, of course, doing an amazing interview with her, an exclusive here on BNC. And if you have any more comments, please go ahead and reach out to us so we can share them here on Making the Case. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and use the hashtag MTC. And coming up next, BNC's legal contributor, Paul Henderson, who also leads the Department of Police Accountability in San Francisco, weighs in on the recent shooting death of 13-year-old Adam Toledo when Making the Case returns.